Hello and welcome to this special edition of the VIP show. In this episode we will be interviewing an expert on the linguistics of the Holy Quran and its divinity. The VIP is Ustad Nu'man Ali Khan. Ustad Nu'man Ali Khan lives in the USA and is the founder of the Bayna Institute for Arabic and Quranic Studies. His lectures and speeches on the linguistic interpretation of the Holy Quran are widely shared. Ustad Nu'man is listed as one of the most influential Muslims in the world. Well, I was born in uh, former East Berlin. My father served in the Pakistan embassy. So I was there until about the age of six. I spent very little time in Pakistan, about six to eight months in Pakistan. Learned a little bit of Urdu. My first language was actually German. And then uh, we moved to Saudi, to Riyadh. And from about 1986 to 92, I was in Riyadh. Um, and I, we went to sort of a separated neighborhood, Urdu-speaking schools. I didn't learn much Arabic, but learned a lot of Urdu, some English. And then since 1993, I've been in the United States. We moved to the United States. I, I went to high school in the U.S. I went to college in the U.S. And I've been there since. How was your relationship uh, with, of course, Islam itself? Uh, you said, you know, it, there was a while where you became an atheist. Yeah, I and went why, to quite a few places. Um, well, the simple version of that is I went to, uh, when I went to the United States, of course I had gone straight from Saudi, a little bit of time in Pakistan, and then to the US. And I went to public school, I went to high school. Majority of the people around me were non-Muslims. Actually, I didn't know any Muslim for the first two years, or first year of high school, I didn't know any Muslims. And um, the environment is completely different, the language is completely different, and you uh, just a natural tendency for a young person is to try to fit in. And of course, the thing that makes me different from everybody else is Islam. As a matter of fact, because you have five days of public school, even on Fridays, you don't take time off to go to Jumu'ah. I didn't. I didn't pray Jumu'ah for t two years when I was in high school. So slowly, you start making friends, and all of my friends are non-Muslims. And of course, if they're non-Muslims, their lifestyle and everything about them is has nothing to do with religion. And so I start adopting, you know, what they what they do. And you know, my parents don't expect me to change. So I have I was kind of someone else at home and someone else when I left home for school, and eventually... Is that the same story as most young kids like you, Muslims living in America? I think to this day, I think to this day, and I, I don't think it's just in America. I think that a lot of these values that we hold dear in Islam, they're not even promoted enough or properly enough, even in Muslim society. I used to think before I traveled outside of the US that what I went through is something, it's specific to me, it doesn't happen to other people. As a matter of fact, it's happening to millions of people even today. You know, and I, I, uh, a point came where, you know, you feel guilty when you're living a life that is against the teachings of your religion. And you hate feel, nobody likes to feel guilty. So eventually you have to decide, either you're going to accept the religion, or you're going to, you don't want to feel guilty anymore, and you just get rid of the thing that makes you feel guilty. Just kill your conscience and just do what you want to do. And that's the road I chose to take at, at one point. And how did you become closer to Islam? And then when did you start to actually study the Quran? It reminds me of a hadith, المرؤ على دين خليله فلينظر أحدكم من يخالد. I was completely away from Islam, um, even early on in college, and I happened to meet, you know, قدر الله ما شاء فعل. Just I just happened to meet this young person who was putting up a flyer for the Muslim Student Association, and I asked him what that was about. And I thought, you know, if it's a Muslim Student Association, they must have the best parties because they must they must get Muslims from all the countries at their parties. So I asked him, do you guys party? And he said, yeah, yeah, we party. <laughs> so, but when I went, it was just these two guys and they're discussing something about the Quran or something. I thought, this is not a place for me. But these guys were really nice to me. And they started spending time with me. They're giving me rides home. And slowly but surely, I still wasn't praying or anything. But one day, you know, one of, one of those friends, he just pulled over to pray. And I just felt bad and I prayed just because he was there. And I just got a taste of it and before I knew it, I was praying five times a day again and relearning how to pray. I didn't even remember how many raka'ah there were in Maghrib and what do you recite you know, when you sit in Qur'ud. I had to go through all of that over again. But I did, alhamdulillah, and it's, I attribute it entirely. Allah made my friends a way to do that. And you think that's a lesson for you know, Muslims to get other Muslims uh, to get back to their Islam? That's correct. I mean, my, one of the most important messages I think that benefited me that I hope other Muslims can benefit from is, number one, there's nobody who's hopeless. Because you know, if you saw me in college, and you were, you were religious, and you just came out of Salat, and you saw me walk by in high school, you would look at me and say, Astaghfirullah al-Azim, look at these people. You know? I was one of those guys. 
But then somebody decided not to judge me and just think of me as just a human being who has some goodness in them, you know? And we have to do that for other people. We have to have some patience with them in giving them Islam, you know? And it's not gonna happen overnight. And this, this brother that I'm talking about, one of my best friends in life, he never actually gave me da'wah to Islam. He never actually told me to pray. He never told me about the Quran. Hafid Quran, wala ma'arif. I had no idea. And he, you know, he's the one that, uh, just through his company, little by little by little, and it was a, a good year-long process that he did this with me for, subhanAllah, that I came towards uh, the deen. And specifically now, uh, your studies on the Qur'an, what led you to study the Qur'an? So when I became, you know, kind of uh, uh, conscious of my religion all over again, I wanted to learn it anew. And so I, caught, I got a translation of the Qur'an, I still remember, I got the Yusuf Ali translation of the Qur'an. I used to read it on the way to college on the train on the subway in, in New York. And uh, I had a hard time understanding it. It's Shakespearean English, there's a lot of thou and thy and thine, and there's a lot of difficult vocabulary, I couldn't process it. On top of that, the Qur'an is complicated in translation because the subject changes and, you know, the, the abrupt sentence endings and things like that, and sentences beginning with the word and, you learn in you know, elementary school, and, and in the beginning, you don't start a sentence with and, and why is the sentence beginning with and? I don't get it, you know? And why is Allah swearing by stuff? Why is He repeating Himself? All these questions came up as I'm reading the translation. And the idea was when you read translation, you're supposed to understand, but that's not the case. You actually end up more confused. So I was looking for some way to understand the Qur'an better. And I was trying to listen to lectures here and there, whatever I could find. But lectures weren't on the Qur'an itself. They were just a topic in Islam. One topic here, one topic there. Until I found a series that was being offered in my local masjid. I was actually in Urdu. Alhamdulillah, so I, I, I went there. Uh, they had a, a dawra in Ramadan. After taraweeh, they would do a dars on the entire Quran, ayah by ayah, translating and brief explanation. So they would do a juz of uh, tafsir mukhtasar in the evenings, a brief tafsir in the evenings for four hours a night from like 10 o'clock uh, at night to 2 in the morning. So I attended the whole thing. And I was just blown away. That it was like the first time I'm hearing the Quran. And at the end of that series, I went up to my teacher and I said, well, I want to I do what you do. It's inc I've never done this. I've never experienced this before. He said, okay, learn Arabic. And I'm in New York. I work full time and I go to college full time. I have no way money to go travel to the Arab world. How am I going to learn Arabic? I said, how do I learn Arabic? He goes, come to my class. It's starting next week. So a week after Eid, I was at the masjid and there's this three week program going on teaching you the basics of Nahu. I knew how to read the Mus'haf, but I didn't understand it. So I'm learning the basics of, of you know, uh, um, uh, Al-I'rab and Nahu, some little bit of self, some verb conjugation. And every time I learn something, it was like the Quran just opened up to me. Like, yeah, I, I still remember like the fourth day of class, we learned what a mudaf and a mudaf ilay is. And so I'm in Salat and we get to uh, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. I was like, oh, mudaf, Rabb mudaf, Al Alameen mudaf ilay. That's awesome. Maliki Yawmiddin. Oh, there's another one. <laughs> Everybody else is thinking about Salat. I'm thinking about where's the Mudaf and where's the Mudaf ilay. <laughs> but it was really exciting. And that was the start of my journey. And SubhanAllah, Allah has made my journey in Arabic studies easier ever since. And there was a particular moment when you realized that the Quran was miraculous. Yeah, yeah. So that was a few years after. So my first step in the Quran was I just want to understand it. And a little bit of Nahu, a little bit of vocabulary, you, know, you begin to fill in the blanks. And you be it begins to make sense to you. But I wasn't satisfied. So I started pushing myself to learn more Arabic. And if you're studying Arabic only for the Quran, you don't know how to speak, you don't know how to communicate, you can't even listen to an Arabic lecture. But I forced myself. So this is about the year 2003, I forced myself to listen to a series called I'jaz al-Quran by Tariq Soydan, may Allah protect him. And it was an eight hour series in Arabic, and I didn't know what he was saying. I was listening to this, and I have no idea what the man is saying, but I'm typing it all up. I'm just writing everything he's saying down in Arabic. So I'm learning to type in Arabic this way, and I go through the dictionary word by word by word for everything he said, and I start taking notes, right? And this was the first time I'm listening to something in Arabic beyond you know, the stuff I used to listen to in English before. And when I, when I start translating this stuff for myself, I'm like, this is unbelievable. I've never seen anything like this before. Where did he, nobody ever told me the Quran has this stuff, you know? And so I started pushing myself to learn more and more Arabic, to access Arabic sources on the Qur'an. And so one of the first inspirational sources I found was uh, Sheikh Mutawadi al-Sha'rawi, rahimahullah. And after him, um, 
probably to this day, the, the endless ocean of Quranic wisdom I found is Dr. Fadl Saleh Hassan al Rai, who's a huge inspiration to me. And I'm very grateful that actually one of his students who did his PhD under him, Dr. Muthanna, Muhammad Muthanna, he lives in Houston, Texas. And so I'm constant in, in constant touch with him indirectly, just asking him questions whenever I get stuck to this day, subhanAllah. And give us a, a few examples of uh, why the Quran linguistically is uh, miraculous and it's divine. It's endless. It's just endless. I'll give you one example. Um, you know what, as I speak to you, I've, we've been going on this interview for 10 minutes, maybe longer, and uh, I don't remember how I organized the words in my sentence. I, I don't recall what happened five minutes ago. I really don't. No, neither do you, as a matter of fact. We keep moving and we don't memorize the events of even moments ago, right? And therefore, what I'm going to say to you now, I can't necessarily organize the words in my sentence based on a consciousness of what I said five minutes ago. That's impossible for me. Maybe subconsciously I might be able to do it, but consciously it is absolutely impossible. For instance, if I was to say I was studying night and day, as opposed to saying I was studying day and night, to me, it makes no difference. It's the same. And I wouldn't consider maybe uh, five minutes ago I mentioned darkness. So maybe it's more consistent since I talked about darkness that I should say night first and day second. I, I can't possibly think in these terms. This is way too much processing for my brain. Allah Azza wa Jalla in the Quran one time He says, "Wa khatam Allahu ala qulubihim, wa ala sam'ihim, wa ala abzarihim ghishawa." Allah placed a seal on their hearts and their hearing, and their eyes were covered. So He mentioned the hearts first. Surah Al Jathiyah He says, "Wa khatam ala sam'ihi wa qalbihi." He put, he put a seal on his hearing, and then his heart, he reversed the sequence. Now what's remarkable about Baqarah is, it begins, There's no doubt in it. Where does doubt exist? In the heart. Where's guidance? Guidance is in the heart. Yahdi qalbahu, Quran says. Where does taqwa exist? Where is iman? You know, وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ He made iman beautiful in your hearts. Everything in the beginning of Baqarah, even the munafiqoon, fi qulubihim marad, their hearts have a disease. The entire subject matter is centered around the heart. So Allah says He placed a seal on their hearts. Now, if you go to Surah Al Jathiyah, it gets really remarkable because in the eighth ayah of Surah Al Jathiyah, Allah says, Yasma'u ayat Allahi tutla alayhi. He listens to the ayat being read on to him, thumma yusirru mustaqbil, and then He turns away arrogantly. The crime mentioned isn't one of the heart first. Even though arrogance is in the heart, but first was refusing to listen. 23 ayahs, like 15 ayat later, this is 8th ayah, 15 ayat later Allah says, He sealed His hearing and His heart. Like how do you maintain consistency with sequencing? And this is one of thousands of examples of just sequencing, which is one of the many things that makes the Qur'an incredible. So when I studied this stuff, I just said, there's no human explanation for this. I mean, the Qur'an is like a vast ocean and their treasures are still waiting to be found. That's correct. That's correct. Every day. Every day I find something. Every day I run into something that I just, I just sit there and baffled like, SubhanAllah, how does, how does he do that? SubhanAllah wa ta'ala. Over and over and over again. The recent subject I got into is names in the Qur'an. You know, and how many names in the Qur'an are actually not even Arabic. They're like Musa alayhi salam's name or you know, Ibrahim alayhi salam's name. These names are pre-Arab. And the Qur'an actually uses them in a way that translated their original meaning. Even from languages that were dead. <laughs> it's, you know, beyond fathom. So linguistically, there's so much to the Qur'an. I mean, that's just one aspect of so many other, you know, different topics and genres within the Qur'an, such as philosophy, you know, science even, uh, religion, morality, history, history, and linguistics. You know, you know, just linguistics just, are just one of it. This is one of it, yeah, yeah. And I felt even though I'm not purely a subject of the linguistics of the Qur'an, but I think it serves as a basis for opening up depth in all the other dimensions in the Qur'an. Like if you don't have depth in language, then you're not going to be able to appreciate the historical accuracy of, accuracy of it, the philosophical depth of it. All of it actually, because you know, the Qur'an itself makes this clear. When Allah calls the Qur'an itself clear, He also says, بِلِسَانٍ عَرَبِيٍ مُبِينٍ So He gave the word mubin as an adjective of the Qur'an, but also of the Arabic language itself, the tongue itself. So, you know, getting clarity on what Arabic words actually mean are a fundamental to understanding depth of tafsir across its various dimensions. 
And it, inshallah, we become students of the Quran in, from multiple dimensions, but this is one of the fundamentals you have to begin with. And how did you set about to try and uh, you know, put more awareness of the miraculous nature of the Quran yeah. to the English-speaking world? This was actually quite a challenge. Because um, when you study Nahu and you study Sarf and then you study Balagha and Arab and Balagha and you study the sciences of the Arabic language, then the more you study them, the more technical they get. And when they get super technical, then you are, you're convinced and your teachers convince you also that this stuff is for Tullab al lugha al Arabiya. Uh, and this cannot benefit someone who doesn't speak Arabic. It's impossible for them to understand this, all this crazy complicated stuff. Until they study it, they won't even get a taste of it. And when I first stumbled upon this, it was so powerful that I said to myself, no, 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 no. There has to be a way to make this simple. There has to be a way to be able to communicate this to someone who is not necessarily an expert in the language, but they can still get a taste of it. So I started experimenting with this. I used to teach Arabic, basic Arabic at one point. And to motivate my students, I would give them a small gem, like, which I learned from like maybe a tafsir, a lughawi tafsir, but I kind of regurgitated it in a way that's easy for anybody to understand. And students were like, whoa, that's, that was pretty amazing. And it would motivate them to come the next day to class. So this was working for a while until there were so many requests, you should just teach a class just on all of these gems. Just, the Arabic is cool, but teach this. So I started a program called Divine Speech. And I taught this maybe uh, 100 times, 150 times maybe, across the United States. And even in England, I taught it once. And um, SubhanAllah, like the response was unbelievable. And it is in, with all due respect, yes, all of the balagh of the Qur'an and all of its beauty cannot be communicated in any other language but Arabic. But a lot of it can be. You can give people a taste. And it's important that we give a taste because once they have a taste, they will want to learn Arabic. We haven't really given them a reason yet. You know, if they, because, you know, telling them you have to learn because the language of Islam is not enough. You have to learn, let me give you a little taste, and they taste the, the sweetness of the Qur'an, then the heart will want to learn, not just the mind. Your heart will be in it, you know? It makes it all worth it, subhanAllah. So this, is, this has been my own motivation, it inspires me to continue to study, and that's what I'm hoping to infuse into others as well. And you set up the Bayina Institute? Yeah. And when was that? 05, 2005. Yeah. And what's its main aims? Its main aims are two. Uh, the first aim of it is to help create a standard for Arabic learning, for the purpose of understanding the Quran, and by extension the religion, to make that easy for Muslims all over the world and even non-Muslims. To make Arabic learning standardized and easy for people all over the world. Look, I learned in New York City. I didn't have a sheikh to learn from except for three weeks. I studied on my own. I went through books that I couldn't benefit from. I went through books that benefited me in some way but not in other ways. I had to find my way, right? But I, I did. At the end of the day, Allah opened the door and he, and he did make me learn it from multiple different ways. So when I teach, I don't teach from the perspective of a teacher. I teach from the perspective of a struggling student who's gone through these exact problems that I'm teaching my students from. So this curriculum I developed, I started experimenting with it and it works. Like my students, they're speaking Arabic really well. They're give, starting to give talks in Arabic. They're translating Dr. Samarai's books now. I don't even do most of the translation and the note taking. My students do it for me, subhanAllah. So it works. Now that I know that it works, I want to take it to the whole world. I want every Muslim to have access to this. That's, one, that's the first goal. The second goal is to raise an awareness and an appreciation for the Qur'an itself. Arabic or not, the Muslims are disconnected from the Qur'an. We don't appreciate what this book has to offer. We haven't thought about its ayat in a reflective way. And the, the, as the, generation, the next generation comes up, the older generation had some more taste of the Qur'an than we did, but the next generation is pretty much disconnected like I was. And so when I got in touch with it, and it changed my life completely, I say to myself, I can't be the only one. There must be billions of people that, ex that will go through the exact same thing, if it was given to them. And if I had to go through so much struggle and spontaneously find it, maybe I should create an institutional effort that, where people could find it without a problem. It's just easy for them to find. And it's going to be in stages, right? So my, my, my objective, for these two objectives, to be able to realize them and to be able to institutionalize this th throughout the world, inshallah ta'ala, is that the latest project of uh, Bayina, which has been going on for a little over uh, a year now, or two years almost, is Bayina TV, uh, which is an online medium by which we are hoping to archive all of this stuff. Even the Divine Speech Seminar I told you about has been recorded and posted on there.
And that brings us to the other important question is, why should the Quran be central to the lives of Muslims? For a number of reasons. I, I would, at the top of it, put our sense of identity. Uh, what are you? What does it mean to be Muslim? Uh, you're not going to have the real answer to that question without a relationship with the Quran. You might have a cultural answer, a heritage answer, an assumed answer to that question, but the genuine answer that, to that question comes when you are directly conversing with Allah in the Quran. Number two, b besides identity, is our, we know that our Iman is something that needs reinforcement. We need str to re-strengthen our faith. That, the mechanism for that is Salah. Allah gave us Salah for that. So we connect to Allah constantly. وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِ For that purpose He gave it to us. The Salah, it's fundamental. The heart of Salah is when you stand in front of Allah and recite Quran. And if you can't understand the Quran, how are you connecting with Allah? So even though your prayer is still good, but the level of connection you can have if you are connected by the word of Allah is something entirely different. So we, and we can't blame the majority of the ummah for not knowing Arabic. We can't just say, oh, you don't know how to, you, your prayer, you know, it's not as good as someone who knows Arabic. Too bad for you. <laughs> we can't do that. We have to make it easy for them to learn. That's our job. Instead of all, this, all these years, we've been telling them, you come here. You come to us and learn. I'm saying, no, let me go to you and teach you. Let me make it easy for you. Because I know it was hard for me too, you know? So and it, 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 I'm telling you, once Muslims get hooked to this, we're going to be a different kind of people. And tell us some of the stories of how people came you know, close to Islam, became Muslim just because of the Quran. I'll tell you a story from last night. So I taught Surah Taha last night, some lessons from Surah Taha and the beauty of the, the story of Musa alayhi salam and how Allah tells it. And at the end of it, a young woman came up to me uh, of, I think, Chinese origin but a, a British uh, raised uh, young woman. And she came up to me and says, I, I've been thinking about Islam, and I was really moved by these lessons from the Quran, and, um, but I'm not sure if I want to become Muslim. And I said, what's holding you back? And she said, I'm not sure. And I said, you have to give me a better answer than that. And she thought about it, and she said, my parents, my friends, you know, people around me, pressure, stress, I said, those are all really good reasons. I said, I, I, can't, I can't compete with that. And I'm not going to tell you that if you accept Islam and you accept this book, that it's going to be easy. I think you're gonna those relationships will suffer, for sure. I'm telling you now, it'll be hard. People will be very angry with you. But what I can tell you is, the peace you're going to enjoy in your heart and the relationship you'll get with Allah is worth the price. And she started crying. She's standing there, she's just crying. And I asked her, you, I told her, you know why you're crying? And she said, why? I said, because you've already accepted. Your heart already accepted Islam. And she was crying even more. And you know, I said, you know, when you're crying, it reminds me of an ayah. Their eyes, roll, tears roll out of their eyes. And she starts crying even more. Then I said, you know, when you, you, you're, you're crying like you're about to make a decision, but you've already made the train already left the station and you're asking me should you get on it or not? You're already on it. And it already left the station. And what are you worried about losing company for? Allah says, Those who believe and do good things, Allah will enter them absolutely into the company of the righteous. This ayah was given in Surah Al Ankabut to companions who lost their family because of Islam. And Allah said, Yes, you've lost one family, I'll give you another one. I'll give you a believing family. Believers will become your family. And she says to me, how do I take the shahada? How do I become Muslim? I said, you take the shahada. She said, how do I do that? And she repeated the shahada after me. SubhanAllah. Now the challenges of Muslims, of course, in today's world, what is, if you like, one of the biggest challenges for them? I think it's not, I don't even call it challenge. I call it opportunity. I really just call it opportunity. We are a people of Alhamdulillah, which means we're a people of optimism. So we can, you know, uh, cry about the political and the social and the economic and the cultural and the education challenges that the Ummah is facing, the spiritual crisis the Ummah is facing. But we've been crying about that a long time. What I see right now is an uh, entire generation of Muslims consider that 60 to 70 percent of the Ummah is under 35 years old. So in the, if, when we talk about the Ummah, we're really talking about the youth. The youth are not a part of our Ummah, they are the Ummah. <laughs> they are the entire Ummah. And these, so many of these people, they're good people, they just weren't given inspiration. They weren't given something that could transform them. I believe if we do our job right, the world can look very different. Our real job is how do we reach these people? 
How do we get a message to them? Because Allah will do the rest. Allah will really, we don't have to do the rest. Allah will do the rest. We just have to get the word to them. And the way, you know how when rain comes, I think of it always like this, like Allah wants us to think of it like this. When rain comes, it's the same rain, and the soil is the same soil, but so many different colored flowers come out. Right? It's the same wahi, it's the same message, but when people get inspired by it, the good that will come will be of so many different kinds. It, and we're gonna just look at this garden of the Ummah and the beautiful goodness that's coming from every different, different direction of natures that we couldn't have even imagined. Min kulli zawjin bahij, and we're just gonna sit back and say, Subhanallah. So that's the, I mean, to me the real challenge is how do we, at the, we, how do we get the water to the thirsty? That's all it is. Tell us a, a story that you'd like you know, to share about how from your own work and from your own lectures uh, that someone actually came close to Islam and the Quran because of your own work. And, and they shared that experience to you. Well, so many people have shared so many like crazy things with me, subhanAllah. Um, I met a young teenager. Uh, this is about almost 10 years ago, or maybe 11 years ago. I was giving a talk and his dad uh, dragged him to a program of mine. Uh, he used to live in Los Angeles and he had uh, Lakers tickets playoff game which is a really big deal because the Los Angeles Lakers and the bas basketball is almost a religion in California. So this young man has tickets to his game and he's about to go and his dad says, no, there's a dars on Surah Al-Fatiha, Nurman Ali Khan is coming, you need to come over. He's like, dad, come on, I have tickets. He dragged him anyway. He dragged his son, told him, I'll, I'll buy you better tickets, I'll get you tickets to the finals, whatever, if they make it, just come tonight. So he convinces him somehow, and he brings him to this program. Three hour program. Can you imagine a teenager sitting for three hours listening to something? And so my program was gonna be Friday night, it was gonna be Saturday all day and Sunday all day. That was the Divine Speech program. Uh, so he, I teach the Friday program. I don't know anything about this, because there's about 800, 900 people in the audience, I don't know. The next day a young man comes up to me and asks me some questions and goes back. I, don't th I think nothing of it. The third day, his mother, is in line and she's crying. And I said, was it something I said? She goes, no, no, no. Um, it's just that when, you, when we brought our son on Friday night, when we were driving back, he told me, mom, can I tell you something? You won't be mad at me? And she said, no, tell me. She goes, tonight was the first time I believed that the Quran is from Allah. And she just bawled in tears. And the son came the next day and the day after. SubhanAllah. So, <laughs> that's not my doing. That's just the word of Allah. When you spread it, it has an effect and it changes people, you know? SubhanAllah. So why isn't there more people like yourself who are doing this? Oh, they are. Work? And there's, there's so many. We do, there are unsung heroes. There are so many mothers in our community. There are so many elders. There are so many friends that are, that are doing this work. They may, not have, uh, they, they may not have a TV interview. They may not have a website. They may not have published something. But they're doing this work, and one of the great joys of me being in this position, because I'm, you know, the, the videos are popular and people know about me and things like that, is those people who no one knows, they know me, and they reach out to me, and they say, I'm doing this work, what do you think? I'm doing that, what do you think? And I get access to this incredible pool of talented people that are doing amazing work in the Qur'an that I would never have even imagined exists, but Allah made me a means, gave, gave me the opportunity through this popularity that they can reach out to me and now I can reach out to them. And it's really been phenomenal for my Islamic studies. Like for example, I had no idea Dr. Fadl Saleh, Saleh Samurai exists. I had no idea. Somebody heard one of my lectures and said, hey, you like the miracle of the Quran subject, right? Maybe you like this person. And they send me a Samurai video and my jaw drops. I said, whoa, I don't know this book. I gotta start over. Then I got all of his books, I pretty much downloaded all of his videos, found all of his transcripts. You know, islamiyat.com was my homepage on like, on my browser for years. But I, I would never have happened if somebody didn't recommend this to me. So there are people of inspiration all over, you know. And we, you know, people recognize me, but Allah recognizes all of them. Allah recognizes all of them, and, and as should we. And what would be, I know you touched upon this before, but what would be your message to the youth at the moment? My message to the youth in the, at the moment would be, Allah expects a lot from you. You have, Allah has given you talents and energy and courage and you know, don't underestimate yourself. People, under, people around you might underestimate you. People might bash Islam so much that you start feeling low self-esteem because you're Muslim. But your Islam should be a source of your pride. 
you should hold your head up high because Allah has honored you with the gift of Islam. And if you can become connected with this book and you can be a so so source of support to each other, then not only will you survive the turbulent age of youth, you'll become a role model for others to come to guidance. You have to think of yourselves as ambassadors of Allah's message. That's my, my message to the youth. I don't, I don't even tell youth, oh, don't listen to music and don't club and don't party and don't, you know, don't do drugs and don't drink alcohol. That's all defensive. That's like talking defense. I don't like talking defense. I like talking offense. Well, why are we supposed to say, save yourself from this, that, and the other, when we should be saying, you need to save humanity from fitna. Don't forget saving yourself from fitna. You should be the source by which humanity is saved from fitna. You know, think of yourself in that position and hold that responsibility because Allah has given you that, subhanAllah. If I can uh, request uh, your audience, inshallah, to help spread the work that we're doing by visiting bayina.tv. It's a very simple URL, bayina.tv. And I hope your audience benefits from the work that we're doing. Barakallahu feekum. Ustaz Naman Ali Khan, thank you very much for joining us. You're quite welcome. Take care, inshallah.